Good afternoon, and a warm welcome to our talk show, Let's Talk Primary Healthcare. My name is Melita Jakob, and I am the head of the WHO European Center for Primary Healthcare. Thank you for joining our fourth talk show. In our previous three editions, we have attracted 200 participants from over 40 countries. And this is very exciting because it shows us that there is continued to interest to talk about primary healthcare. In our previous three editions, we considered the transformative processes we are seeing at primary healthcare level during the pandemic. We have looked into priority setting and demand management strategies to respond to increased need. And we discussed how to better support the health and well being of our health workforce, our most precious resource. Today, we're going to consider the perspective of people, especially those most in need and most vulnerable. The pandemic has revealed a wide range of vulnerabilities with connected health and social factors. Public services, private services have been severely disrupted and primary healthcare proved itself to be closest to the people and the most effective vehicle to deliver a range of health services but also wider social services. But do we know at the community and practice level who are those most in need? Do we know who are the most vulnerable? Are we able to apply comprehensive approaches to identify them beyond single diseases? Are we able to connect health and social determinants of health? And once we have identified them, are we delivering to them in real time tailored services that matter? And after all, is this all about data and technology or is there more to it? These questions are in the focus of today's conversation, how to move from words to action to identify those most in need at primary healthcare level. We're going to start with a one hour panel conversation. And after that, we invite you into two breakout sessions in Russian and English language to share your country experiences and to hear from you. In the meantime, Please use the chat window, say hello to us, share your questions, share your observations and comments. We will take them and discuss them in the breakout sessions. My colleagues are also going to use the chat window to share useful resources to, with, us, with, with you as we go along with the talk show. And with that, let me now welcome and introduce our panel. Hello, and uh, thank you very much for joining us. Today we have with us Kaya Kleskamp, who is the Health Equity Lead in the Ministry of Social Affairs from Estonia. Dr. Dan Alpen, who is a General Practitioner and National Population Health Management Clinical Advisor in the NHS England in the United Kingdom. Esteban de Manuel Kino, who is Senior CEO of the Chronic Gunga Institute for Health Services Research in the Basque Country in Spain. And Jose Cerezo, Health Policy Analyst at the WHO Regional Office for Europe. Thank you for joining us today and share your experiences about this very important topic. Let's start our first round of discussion looking at what countries have done during the pandemic to reach those who have been disproportionately affected. Kaya, let us start with you and the experience of Estonia and as health equity lead in the Ministry of Social Affairs, what did you do to identify and reach those in vulnerable situations during the pandemic? Thank you, and uh, thank you, Polita, for, for having to discuss with you on, on, on uh, such an important topic. Uh, the, the COVID pandemic has been a true roller coaster, right? <laughs> Creating health system challenges everywhere. And then in Estonia, primary health care has been on the front line, trying to cope being the first contact point for, 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 the, for the population. And we were fortunately able to make rapid changes in the primary healthcare organization by introducing a system that no person, even without health insurance coverage or family doctor, would be left without help. We quickly reorganized to a so-called primary healthcare response center system, defining responsible providers from different regions to serve these, these patients to ensure access to, to everyone. Maybe secondly to mention is that, is that the family doctors in Estonia have been giving, given the role of, of vaccination of high-risk patients, like in, in many countries. 
the providers have uh, uh, received a predefined list of who are the high-risk patients in their catchment area. And uh, these are, in many cases, the same chronic uh, patients with whom the primary healthcare providers are already in close and continuous contact to manage their health problems. So our providers have been actively reaching out to these patients, consulting them on vaccinations, agreeing the time for vaccinations, and et cetera, all belong, belong, belong to this process. And, and uh, I also need to mention that the role of nurses in, in this and, and, and in having a multidisciplinary team at primary healthcare level has really played a, a, a leading role. And thirdly, in Estonia, we have been fortunate uh, to have already a hand and have the possibility to scale already available technical solutions that would make it easier to exchange data and stay in contact with the patients to remain access to essential services. So although the, the primary health care providers have been serving people almost throughout the, the pandemic with, with small uh, exceptions, it has always it has hasn't always been easy to access specialist care services for for example because many of the patients are not willing to commute and 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 travel and are actually scared so to limit the need uh, traveling and then and, and taking account uh, the 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 situation of 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 the patient the family doctors can use e-consultations with specialist care providers if a patient would need to be referred to a specialist. So therefore, the specialist can consult electronically in a secure manner, the primary health care provider, without making the patient actually to travel long distances if, if they're actually not ready or, or if it's not possible for them to do so. So these may be the, 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 some of the examples from Estonia. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Kaya. We will come back to some of these as we go along. Let us now consider the example of England. And Dan, you're wearing several hats, but uh, I'd like you to come in uh, as a practicing GP. Uh, who in your practice were the most vulnerable during the past year and how did you reach them? Thank you. So um, vulnerability um, is really a multifaceted issue. Um, you have medical vulnerability because of underlying conditions, but you also have social vulnerability if you're isolated. If, for example, you would struggle to get food deliveries, you would struggle with your personal care needs. Mm. And the, the pandemic, when it hit now over a year ago, it really um, disrupted the whole social fabric of society. And we were quite fortunate um, in England, particularly where, where I work, that we have data on not just health, but also social care. And so what we did when the pandemic hit is uh, we used our, our data, uh, which is uh, fortunately linked between health and social care, to identify a cohort, a group of people within our population who are vulnerable from either a medical perspective or a social perspective. So potentially people that live alone, potentially people who have pre-existing frailty, potentially uh, people who our local government, our local authority is aware that they need uh, specific support. So for example, there's a service offered by local government here called assisted bin collection, whereby if people struggle to take their bin to the curb, on bin day, uh, they can apply to the local authority for help. So the, the, the dust and the bin men can, can help with the lifting um, from the house to the curb. And that list was one of many that was combined in our, our linked data sets to help identify different parts of our community who are vulnerable. Uh, and so being able to have access to that data, we're able to create a, a master list of people we thought would be really potentially vulnerable and therefore benefit from a proactive telephone call from either uh, one of our social prescribers. These are professionals that work within primary care to help address people's uh, social um, uh, challenges. 
particularly those that impact on their on their health outcomes, or alternatively, part of the team that made these proactive calls were from our local government. So we were able to identify the vulnerable groups, both in terms of uh, health vulnerability, but also social vulnerability, and proactively telephone them, working out what is needed, be it assisted uh, shopping, be it as was very, very popular in many cases, uh, friendship calls, somebody to call them regularly during the lockdown, during the pandemic. Uh, and we put in place various interventions, both in terms of their health and, and social needs in order to address this. And we worked closely also with our, our voluntary sector colleagues in, in, in charities and other local organizations. Um, and so by being able in summary to, to identify groups of our population with specific needs through linked data sets, we were able to tailor a solution that addressed their needs more holistically than just medical vulnerabilities. Very, very interesting. And there are very important keywords in uh, both of your responses, right? Uh, digital solutions, integration of data, integration of services, holistic approaches, and tailoring to needs. And it sounds like both Estonia and England have been quite successful. Um, can I have a very quick comeback to each of you of what are the top two, three features that you already had present in your health system before the pandemic? that enabled you such a successful approach to reach the vulnerable? Uh, and what is it that you identified as missing? Kaya, let's come back to you first and then followed by them. I think a major importance was played on, 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 on uh, that the, we already have a service developer model uh, developed at primary healthcare level, which is used, uh, that the primary healthcare providers are used to outreach for the patient. They really call the patient and uh, uh, advise them on uh, under chronic care management, which would uh, make this process easier during during the during the uh, pandemic, and so they know their empanel population fairly well already. And uh, secondly, the primary healthcare providers to to uh, uh, have on hand already quite detailed health data of their population, uh, which uh, which one is, is one of the important factors, but we see that further progress should really be made to implement a more community-centered approach to find the most vulnerable, integrating uh, data with, with social care data, which is not uh, currently the case in Estonia. And, and uh, this would help to better risk stratify the, the patients, definitely. Um, and, and also what we have seen is that the quality of primary healthcare providers varies uh, a lot and therefore some of the providers need much more support than, uh, than the others in this process. Thank you. Dan, over to you, although you already mentioned a number of uh, key factors, but uh, let's hear your reflections. Thank you. Um, I think the first thing that's worth considering is data. Data is very powerful. Um, it's only the start of what we would call a population health management approach, but it is the first step. And so we are lucky in England in that we have um, the National Health Service. Um, the way it's set up allows us to begin a journey to link data across uh, the different parts of the National Health Service, and then crucially involving the very rich data that we can get from colleagues in social care uh, and then you can begin to refine your cohorts, your groups of the population you identify that need particular support. Uh, and actually, um, that, that data, uh, although um, we're lucky in, in England, um, it's certainly something across the world, I'm sure, that a start can be made by considering what data is available and what you can, what you, what you can do with it to shift your care from reactive to proactive. The, the other main feature I would suggest is integration. Um, so uh, when you identify your cohort and you realize something else needs to be done uh, in order to improve their medium and long-term health outcomes, uh, you inevitably come to the conclusion when you dig beneath, beneath the surface of the data that wider determinants of health um, are absolutely crucial. So issues such as housing, um, pollution, uh, financial pressures, um, exercise, all of these uh, all of these features um, do need addressing as well as the uh, pathology that's immediately presenting. Uh, and in order to address these, you need integration across health services, social care, the voluntary sector, local government, 
Uh, you need a unified uh, approach and you need the channels of communication between the different organizations to be open in almost a cultural shift towards what is true integration. Um, we in England are on that journey, both in terms of data and integration, uh, but we are at variable levels in different parts of the, of the country. And there is a national strategy really to make population health management the, the importance of a rich data infrastructure and true integration key features of how we deal with health in the future. There was uh, a lot in there, and we're going to unpack uh, many of your comments uh, one by one. Let us start with this term, population health management, part of the title of our talk show, part of your own work title, Dan. And Jose, let me bring you in. What is population health management? What are population health management approaches to bring us all to the same level of understanding? Thank you very much, uh, Malita. So I'm building on the very interesting examples uh, brought by Dan and Kaya. I think that we can say that population health management is a proactive approach to managing the health and well-being of a population, which aims to consider at the same time, and this is very important, social and healthcare needs, costs, and outcomes. And in a much simpler way, it is about looking at data to be able to drive decision making so that people get the right support, the right care at the right time for them. And this is what we have been preliminary discussing. So I think that it is very important to clarify that we are not talking about a purpose itself or a given tool. It is more about the way we look at our population in the first place and how we use the information we get from our existing databases, like the one that has been mentioned, but also from patient and community directly, <clears throat> so we can match population and individual needs to service provision. And I bet that our audience is tired to hear that one size does not fit all, right? Well, so population health management through processes such as population segmentation or risk stratification that we will uh, discuss in greater detail later, allow health systems and primary care to operationalize this concept, ensuring that no one slips through the net. And to finish, I just like to uh, reinforce uh, Dan's idea about that data is just part of the picture. So if we don't change radically the way in which services have been historically provided, even the most sophisticated data analysis of the best possible database you can imagine won't be translated into the health impact we are all after. That's, that's very interesting. And we are. I promise we are going to end up there to talk about the service delivery. But let's stay here at population health management. And Spain has been a leader in Europe in health equity, and its various regions have also excelled at uh, population health management and risk stratification, and so does the Basque country. Esteban, the floor is yours. Where, tell us a little bit about your approach in the Basque country, where you are with this process now, and complement Jose's narrative about population health management and different types and different approaches. Yes, I think that just to complement what Jose has just said, I think that we, for, with population health management, we can have three types of approaches. One is a retrospective approach, and this is the use of population health management to learn about what had happened, to get more knowledge about, and, and, and so that we can understand better how to deal with problems in the future. So it's a kind of evaluation use of population health management. I just would use a couple of examples of Spain. For example, in Spain, uh, the Aragonese Institute of, of uh, Health uh, Studies uh, produces the Atlas of Medical Practice Variation, collecting data from all regions of Spain, from all discharges of, of uh, hospital patients in Spain every year. And with that, they publish different analysis. And for example, they have been able to identify for example, a fourfold variation in avoidable hospitalizations for chronic patients, for example. And that's using data, as Dan and Jose has mentioned, and to try to improve our quality service. Or, for example, regarding the uh, COVID pan pandemic here in the Basque Country, a group uh, of uh, two health institutes have uh, analyzed the data of more than 14 patients according to the outcome in terms of 
use of primary care, hospital, or even uh, Alcantara's death for those 14 patients. And they have found that uh, alongside with health as a risk factor, for example, the previous health status uh, defined for all those patients beforehand with all our uh, population health management tools or risk certification, which I will explain later, are one of the more uh, uh, interesting predictable factors in uh, understanding what is going to be the outcome of those patients. Another approach is the cross-sectional approach, the reaction to what is happening now using population health management to uh, direct our decision making and to orient our action. Uh, for example, again, coming back to the COVID experience, uh, as everywhere in, in Europe, most primary care physicians have shifted to telephone consultations, to teleconsultations, to deal with the demand of patients. Well, for example, uh, here with the data that are provided in the clinical record of its patient, its patient is classified according to the health needs, and they were able to identify those phone calls of patients with mild uh, COVID-like symptoms, but be able to filter them and to classify them according to their potential risk. Uh, those patients that were classified in, with different health risks were monitored much closer for, for COVID. Or for example, these uh, segments of the population that it, of patients according to their risk is being used to uh, define the vaccination programs and, and priorities of the COVID uh, strategy for vaccination. And finally, the third approach is the prospective one, the future one, using population health management, as, for example, risk certification, to try to identify uh, vulnerable patients that may have in the future uh, potential avoidable adverse events or adverse situations that we can prevent. And for that, for example, the past country is developing since 2010, a universal program uh, stratifying all the population, more than 2 million, 200,000, according to four different strata. And, and uh, the idea is to identify those most vulnerable groups so as to implement specific care path pathways to try to improve their health in the future. And there are some examples that I might come back later. Thank you. This, this really helps uh, structure our thinking. And before we go deeper into data needs and approaches of risk stratification, I'd like to pause for a moment and consider the perspective of people. What does population health management bring to the beneficiaries, to the people? And I'd like to invite you to watch a short video with us uh, of a couple in England and how population health management has enabled to tailor services for them. I thank the NHS for the opportunity uh, to use this video in our talk show. I've got type two diabetes and I was diagnosed with it around 10 years ago. I've also got type 2 diabetes. I was diagnosed probably about eight years ago. Some groups of patients aren't responding to our standard one-size-fits-all approach to support them to improve their health and lifestyles. Within Berkshire West Integrated Care System, we're working very closely with partners in health, social and the voluntary sector to bring data together in a new way. There are quite devastating consequences with type 2 diabetes, um, which can sort of cause premature death. So these are things like um, heart disease and strokes. So it's really important to intervene early so we can prevent these complications from happening. We used to have to go to the GP surgery once a year for a review meeting. We were told when we needed to go in, we'd get our medication assessed and our blood sugars assessed and we would be prescribed new medication. We were told what was the right thing for us, what was the right medication and, and how we should behave and what we should and shouldn't eat. 
um, and, and there wasn't a lot of two-way dialogue. If I'm honest, I'll say that our approach to it, when mine definitely was, I've got this, but I can take some tablets, I'll take the pills and crack on. We were gradually deteriorating. Every year the medication would be stepped up a little bit and I could gradually see the blood sugars rising. We identified a group of patients with type 2 diabetes that did seem to be slipping through the net. And we went out and we asked them why this was the case. Dr Alton called us and had a long conversation with us about um, a potential group session. And it was really great to have that personalised approach where he was keen to understand what would work for us rather than just being the medical professional telling us what the right answer was. So we had a one and a half hour group session. It was quite a casual setting. We were able to divulge lots of information in a detailed fashion to a large number of people. We felt like we were having a conversation with somebody that was interested in getting a plan together involving all of our things, not just what we ate and what our sugar levels were. I think we both walked away from that with a much better understanding of why things happened, how they worked and how we could work in tune with them. So the beauty of this approach is it offers local solutions to local problems. We have the analyst support to be able to interrogate the data we now have available to really pin down which groups we need to support better. We've taken dairy largely out of our diet. Um, we've cut back on bread. We're eating a lot more fish, salad, and a lot of nuts and porridge. We've also upped our exercise, so we're doing a lot more walking. The change in the bloods was immediate, almost from our finger testing. We could see, like really within three days, how quickly that had started to show results, which was very encouraging. We're less reliant on the medication to keep them low. It's, it's controlled as much by the diet as the medication. For me as a GP, this offers a way of providing a different service that is tailored to our patients that we know will work. Dan, let me come to you first for reactions uh, to the video. And as I understood, uh, this couple actually lives uh, in your practice. Uh, what type of data you need to have to be able to tailor services to the people? And how does better data enable you to provide tailored services rather than a one-size-fits-all approach? Yeah, so this, this example um, was obviously, as you can see from before the COVID pandemic, um, but as we recover from COVID, hopefully, uh, we are thinking about the future and how we can provide service to our whole population that works, um, rather than, a, a, as, as was said in the video, a one-size-fits-all approach that works for certain groups but not others. So in, in this case, when we looked at our data on diabetes outcome, we found that there was a, a group of the population who responded quite well to, to traditional approaches, but another group of the population who, as um, the patients were describing in the video, were not responding well each year their uh, diabetes control was worsening little by little and often patients within this group wouldn't attend their their um, planned uh, review uh, consultations and so on so by looking at the data we could actually understand we could pin down who that group was uh, and we could contact them we could have uh, some honest conversations as was described as to well why uh, is your diabetes like this? What are the wider factors involved? And we found that there were some common themes. Uh, often um, the, the focus was described by patients as too medicalized. It was too much about attending a review appointment, being put on a new medication, rather than uh, a more person-centered approach, uh, which is um, what was described in terms of uh, longer group consultations, something we are experimenting very successfully with, in order to really uh, take a holistic approach and look at the wider determinants in their lives that may be leading to a decline in their diabetes. For example, uh, diet, exercise, lifestyle. Um, but the point is with population health management methodology, we can identify the groups of our population who are slipping through the net, who from the data it's indicated they are, are not doing well in whatever condition or situation we're looking at, health or more widely, uh, and then we can uh, work with our patient groups to understand the reasons for this and put in place interventions like was described to uh, avoid a one-size-fits-all approach and instead tailor the intervention to the specific needs of those population cohorts. Thank you. Uh, 
very, very interesting. And let's uh, now contrast that with the experience of the Basque country uh, in Spain. Esteban, you also have great experiences in risk stratification. Uh, please do share with us. Yes, as I said before, the Basque country since 2010 is trying to uh, deploy a risk stratification strategy covering the whole population. The idea is that with this uh, strategy, we can identify complex fray patients and high-risk patients and maintain them under the radar, radar of the of the of the system. So as we can provide, so that we can provide continuous longitudinal integrated care to them. And the 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 second aim is that, as uh, Dan mentioned, that we can ensure that the uh, uh, healthcare programs pathways reach all the people in need, that no people gets without understanding. So those are the main, the main ideas. And for that, we have developed a, a risk certification tool that uh, uh, builds on data coming from different sources and data from all citizens and, 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 and patients within the citizens group, of course. So as to, at the end of the day, classify our population in four different strata, in high complexity patients, high risk patients, chronic patients, and, and of course, uh, the healthy population, according to the very well-known uh, model of the Kaiser Permanente Risk Pyramid of the chronic model. This is easy to say, but, but not so easy to, to do. You have to take into account that we are talking about more than, as I said, 2 million, 200,000 population, more than 20 million appointments, more than uh, 32 million drug prescriptions, or more than uh, 1 million emergency department visits, and so on and so forth. So, so with all this information has to be uh, assigned to one record per each patient. So with all this, at the end of the day, try to uh, find an outcome measure that can be a proxy of risk in the future. Because the whole idea is not just to identify who is in need at this moment, as I said before, a cross-sectional analysis. But what we try to do is who will be in need in the next year so that we can have a proactive early intervention with, with these people. And, and well, uh, uh, for that, we our, our uh, statisticians, data analytics, uh, informatics have been working for, for, for all, through all these years, and we produce uh, results with what our outcome measure is what we call the predictive index. And this predictive index is a measure of the uh, predicted healthcare costs of each patient in the next year. And we use this predicted healthcare cost as a proxy indicator of healthcare needs. For, with that, we identify the, the let's say, 5% more uh, uh, in need uh, or expected in need patients. And for those, we have uh, defined uh, specific care pathways for multimorbid patients, for COPD patients, heart failure patients, and diabetes patients, but only for those patients in those groups which are in most, most or will be most in need. For example, for the multimorbid patients, we have a cutoff, a threshold level of uh, trying to reach those patients, multimorbid patients, who have a predictive uh, index of more than 6.2. What does 6.2 mean? It means that those people are expected to have 6.2 more health expenditure than the average uh, citizen in the past country. So we think that those are the ones that will be most in need. And well, this is in a few words what we try. I must say that we have made some evaluation of whether this approach is useful, and there were some publications on that. And for example, what we have found that uh, using this approach of identifying those 
patients and deploying targeted care pathways or care programs for them have been able to improve uh, access of those most deprived groups to primary care and even hospital care in, in the case of multimodal patients. Uh, the UK and Spain are, of course, two countries that have a long history of population health management, risk stratification, and tailoring services. Uh, but what can be advised to those countries who are just now getting inspired about doing population health management better? Where to begin? How to go step by step? Jose, can I bring you in on this? What advice do we have for countries who are less advanced in their population health management approach? Thank you, Melita. So the first step towards population health management usually involves shifting from single risk factor management to total risk prediction for a relatively small groups of related conditions. And this is the case, for example, of the risk stratification tool for cardiovascular disease, which is included in the WHO package of essential non-communicable disease interventions, the WHO PEM package. It offers a very simple way for countries to identify those who are at the highest risk of suffering a vascular event, such as an acute myocardial infarction or a stroke, and being able to target in resources to them. These resources may include drug treatment, for instance, but also evidence-informed nurse-led patronized visits as well. Then the next generation of risk stratification tools are those that when defining risk and complexity, are able to account for multimorbidity, <coughs> which is the presence of multiple chronic conditions at the same time. This is a major advance because we know that multimorbidity is on the rise in our society. So being able to consider it provides health system with a fairly realistic picture on the current and future, as Esteban was highlighting, health outcomes of the population. However, as we have heard from Dan and, and, and Stefan, this requires at least a system-wide use of patient registry uh, and electronic medical records for database <laughs> building, but also sophisticated capacity for data analytics. An example of these tools are those used in Veneto or Lombardy regions for case management and case uh, finding, the, the, the best example brought by Esteban, and also the uh, adjusted morbidity groups, which are used in many Spanish regions. Finally, the next level, let's say the last generation of these tools, are those that assess at the same time clinical and social complexity that are able to account for the social determinants of health. And for instance, the Agency for Health Quality Assessment of Catalonia, Spain, produce a socioeconomic index to measure the deprivation, and this is very important, at the level of primary care catchment areas. And mm. this index is the result of combining, among other, for instance, information on the percentage of population unemployed, the percentage of population born in low and middle income country, the percentage of elderly living alone, or the socioeconomic status of the population. And what happens is that this index is integrated with the aforementioned ad adjusted morbidity groups and allows primary care teams to identify clinically and socially complex patients. And, and just to fi uh, uh, finalize, this uh, index is also used to adjust resource allocation for each primary care team based on the socioeconomic level of its served population. And I believe Estonia would be a very illustrative example uh, to listen to uh, how to move forward in this trajectory. And Kai, I'd like to bring you in and consider a little bit of a longer perspective of Estonia's health system uh, strengthening and development and moving towards population health management. 20 years ago, uh, your health system also focused very much on single disease diagnostics and management. Where are you in moving away from that model to a much more holistic approach and to put in place this proactive primary health care that enables to identify people and tailor services to their needs? So yes, indeed, the <laughs> Estonian background is quite different from, from Spain and UK, like, like is the ban and ten and we're describing uh, who have enjoyed a long history of public health management and deeply rooted health equity, equity goals. But we have started uh, off from uh, historically he inherited very much disease-centered and specialized care focused health service delivery model in the 90s. So it has been a long journey 
where I would say changes in the service delivery model have played a key role and but definitely being supported also by data availability and and, and uh, data exchange platforms. So thanks to many successful primary healthcare reforms, we have managed to build a strong system where the focus is on, on managing risk factors, improving disease prevention and, and trying to implement uh, a, a holistic approach instead of disease specificness. But uh, during the period of primary healthcare reforms, we we uh, during the period we did uh, continuously uh, look for other examples and definitely learn from advanced health systems close by, for example in Finland and so on. So this has certainly been a part of of, of the progress to learn learn from others who have achieved that already. But up until today, more and more uh, acknowledges that, that we need to look at people's health needs through a different lens, including perspective of population health management, uh, including social determinants of, of, of health. And uh, uh, But uh, like I said, the service delivery model is playing the key role. The implementation has not been always easy because of the very much rooted disease specific uh, concepts and and uh, and only uh, up until today we sometimes see as well a specialist care focus so there are still challenges I believe we have made first steps uh, uh, and uh, we have been adopting uh, performance monitoring system making available data and and uh, that is needed for performance monitoring. And uh, I don't want to underestimate the, the availability of data because this has helped us to provide the evidence in support of health population, health management at the primary health care level. And therefore has been helpful for getting better understanding of the primary health care role in public health management among medical society and also health policy makers. And uh, uh, the next steps uh, for us, uh, I think we need to learn how to use uh, the data that we already have a little bit better uh, in targeting the most vulnerable. And this is why we are already making steps toward the systems that Jose described, uh, Stepan, uh, uh, also with uh, with uh, uh, with a proactive uh, approach using a, a risk stratification model we are currently piloting that by predefining the most vulnerable patients with multiple chronic conditions and then setting the really patient centered care plans and trying to also shift the service to mid delivery model being more like not patient-centered, but person-centered, and taking account the person's social care needs, and uh, and also uh, trying to improve cooperation with with specialist care providers. So today we, we can't unfortunately say that that we already have uh, a successfully implemented uh, comprehensive population health management at primary health care level yet. But we are certainly uh, making progress. And uh, like I said, we acknowledge it's a long journey. Thank you very much. I, I found your example very, very encouraging that it is possible to move from a disease-specific approach to a more holistic approach, from a passive to a proactive approach by focusing on more integrated information and data at catchment area and community level and also adjusting the service delivery model and care pathways in response to that. And in fact, this brings us to our final round where I'd like to move a little bit away from considering data and technical issues like risk stratification. What else do we need to move proactively to population health management at primary healthcare level? And Jose, let me bring you in. What has population health management helped Spain to implement in terms of a more proactive model of primary health care? 
Thank you, Melita. So the backbone of primary healthcare in Spain are multidisciplinary teams underpinned by a strong family medicine and also by advanced nursing roles. So population health uh, management data can be used for enhancing multidisciplinary service delivery, I would say in two main ways. First, from a health management perspective, it can help adapting the composition of the teams to the particularities of the population they serve. And this, this has a lot of value. For instance, the socioeconomic intelligence that I have described earlier that primary care teams have may result in reinforcing teams that are working in more deprived areas with an additional number of social workers. Accurate information on forecasted individual and population needs can also help primary care teams to adapt to a surge in mental health needs like uh, the what we are witnessing now driven by the COVID-19 pandemic, for instance, by hiring additional clinical psychologists and including them in the primary care network. And second, I could say that population health management data can be also used as a collaborative decision-making <coughs> tool for organizing the work of the team and for distributing tasks within the team around the patient needs. And some examples would be, for instance, that it can help primary care nurses decide jointly with the social worker which patients required home visits. And just to finish, I, I like to say that there are now emerging experiences of uh, some primary care teams going a step beyond and radically reorganizing their usual way of working by establishing specific sub-teams within, within the primary care team to care for, on a permanent basis, different segmented and risk stratified population groups. We already have uh, some very strong emerging messages that for population health management, we clearly need data and more integrated, better data put to active use, and we need that at community level. But as all of you have been saying, we need a different model of care, more multidisciplinary, more team-based, involving family doctors, nurses, but also social workers and psychologists. What else do we need beyond these two factors? Then let me come to you from the perspective of an active practice. What else do we need to move towards population health management? And in your particular case, for an advanced uh, example, where should the NHS invest in, in the future, having learned from the pandemic? Thanks. Um, I think what we're looking at here is a, a gradual transition. So if we look at the way we traditionally um, organized our health services, you would have a patient who has a presentation of a problem, they would go and see their general practitioner, they would then be referred to a cardiologist, for example, they would then develop a further complication that would affect their ability to live independently, they would then be referred to a social uh, care service of some sort, and then they would go backwards and forwards from their GP to all these different places, and the GP would, to a certain extent, um, do their best to uh, coordinate all of this care, but it would be fragmented in certain regards. The transition we're aiming to achieve is using the data as we discussed to be proactive, so to identify those population groups who would benefit not just from a referral to a cardiologist, but also looking at their holistic needs, including social care needs, including wider drivers of this poor health, which could be financial, it could be to do with their activity levels. It needs a more person-centered, holistic approach to comprehensively address all of those drivers of, of poor health outcomes. Uh, and we're transitioning towards that approach. I think particularly within um, the NHS, within primary care, through uh, trying to instill a, a, a team culture and a team culture that involves not just working within our, our primary care teams better in a more organized, data-driven holistic manner, but also with all of our colleagues across the rest of the health service, social care and the voluntary sector, with the patient always at the center. Now, um, in terms of the way this works in practice, a part of this is an expansion in England of um, primary care to create what, what we call primary care networks. And these are groups of uh, practices covering 30 to 50,000 patients on average. Uh, and it comes from a recognition that to address the holistic needs of patients in an integrated manner, 
You can't uh, achieve this very easily on a practical level if you work in a practice like mine of 7,000 patients. You would want to, to employ a social prescriber, uh, a health and well-being coach to really, as was described in the video, sit down and have the time to discuss the wider drivers within that person's lifestyle of, of their poor health outcomes. You would want to look at having mental health support workers like was discussed uh, just a few minutes ago. But it's hard to uh, put that in practice with a small practice of 7,000. So by practices, GP practices coming together um, in those primary care networks, you can put in place a wraparound infrastructure of different professionals to help address the uh, holistic needs of your patients by utilizing the economy of scale. And you could also, as a primary care network, uh, neatly set up the governance structure to create true integrated team working with your colleagues across health and social care in the voluntary sector and patient groups and communities. So that's the, um, the, the vision that we are putting in place and, uh, uh, and it's relatively new in the, the scale of health service development, but it's showing great potential and we're getting a real shift as a result of this alternative uh, nuanced infrastructure from, uh, as has been mentioned, a purely reactive healthcare where the patient sees you and is referred onwards somewhere else, but we're not really grasping the bull by the horns, to, to use an expression, really addressing their true integrated holistic need. And we're moving from that reactive to a much more proactive holistic approach. Uh, I heard you two very important uh, things. Uh, and the first one is that we don't only need multidisciplinary teams, but we need to scale them and connect them into a larger network and connecting them into a larger network gives us a very different range of opportunities to deliver a much larger range of services closer to the people at primary healthcare level. I'm so happy to share with everybody that our office is working on a policy paper, a multidisciplinary, integrated, and networked primary healthcare services. And you will soon hear from us about this. We will also organize a talk show around this topic, spelling out the benefits of such approaches country examples, and we will provide all of you an opportunity to share your experiences uh, when we do that. But to move forward, Kaya, let's come back to you. Where is the future for Estonia? You have already mentioned a few items, but let's think a little bit more long term. Let's think to a 10 year distance. Uh, where is the future? What would you like uh, to happen in Estonia in the coming decade? I, I here really uh, need to uh, agree with Dan, and I'm very welcome to hear that the WHO is also already working on the initiative of, of these primary healthcare networks. This is definitely something that is the future also, would need to be the future also in Estonia, especially having currently the challenges of sustainability of the service in, in, uh, in more rural areas and uh, by networking uh, wider sub of providers could help to 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 manage this uh, this uh, sustainability crisis as we already uh, um, state in uh, in Estonia. Currently, uh, Estonia has made uh, major investments from the European structural funds to build and modernize the primary healthcare centers to actually move toward the more multidisciplinary uh, teams and and also try with with the aim to integrate uh, better the services with social sector and and uh, and also specialist care, which are very much. Uh, in certain cases, still silos, uh, unfortunately. So this is something we definitely continue to to work on. And um, uh, I really like the approach uh, also on uh, building the team-based service delivery models. Uh, Estonia has been quite successful in increasing the uh, role of nurses at primary healthcare level, but uh, implementing other healthcare specialists has been uh, still uh, a challenge. Um, so only recently, uh, the primary healthcare providers uh, have been started to 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 finance additional uh, stuff like mental health nurses, physiotherapists, psychologists. Uh, to to create the uh, uh, multidisciplinary teams and and uh, uh, really glad to say that the providers can actually choose 
which experts they need for their population uh, and and their impaneled um, um, patients. So uh, depending on on the need of of these these exact communities. Um, the Ministry of the Social Affairs in Estonia has uh, recently put quite some focus on integrating social sector and 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 uh, primary healthcare sector services. I've made several pilots on this, um, like mentioned, but uh, the progress has been limited. So uh, in the future, we still see that uh, wider screening of social care needs needs to be at the level of, of, of primary health care as well, and there needs to be better integration with, with social services. And um, in addition to this, we also will in, continue to invest in different digital solutions, as Estonia has, is, is known to be, and, and we will definitely continue to do so in, in the future to, uh, with a main aim to improve uh, uh, integration of services and, and access to services. There is certainly a much more longer list that, that we are, are aiming to do to, because strengthening primary health care is one of the main policy goals in, in, in Estonia. But uh, I think I, I managed to mention with this short time the, the most important ones. So thank you. Indeed, and that's a very nice and ambitious plan. And we look forward to learning with you uh, on this journey. And that bring us, brings us to the final intervention. Esteban, I'm going to give you the floor for closing uh, our plan, panel. And let's dream, let's look long term. What kind of opportunities we have in the digital age to strengthen population health management that we didn't have before? Well, it's a continuous process, Melita, yes. Uh, I think that, first of all, we have we will have better data. We will improve our data, our accuredness, completeness, timeliness of our data. We have broader sources of data. Uh, Dan is uh, lucky enough to have access to social data, but we will have also biomarkers, genetic data, environmental data, and so forth to feed our systems. We will have more powerful tools uh, natural language processing tools, artificial intelligence, but also all this kind of big data and other tools. And fourth, we probably will be much better implementing risk regression tools, communication, having uh, analysts, data analysts on board in our health systems that are lacking. Uh, we will engage better clinicians. We will be better in communication, understanding things. So uh, with all this, we will be able to provide much better results in terms of more knowledge based on the evaluation I mentioned. We will improve the uh, support for decision-making for clinicians, for managers, for policymakers. And we will be able to improve the pathways and programs that we deploy to match the needs of our population. So at the end of the day, we will be able also to link better personalized medicine, precision medicine with population health interventions and, and deal not only with the needs of our groups of population, but with the uh, specific needs of our individual patients. So just to finalize, just as a recommendation, uh, we want, as somebody said before, I think was Jose, we, we, for different needs, we will need different tools. For, uh, it's not only important that we have the best risk models and so on and so forth, but we have to match them with effective, cost-effective and adequate interventions, programs. Uh, you mentioned before, integrated care, primary care teams and so on and so forth. And, Finally, don't forget that we need to have clinicians, healthcare professionals on board. All these tools are tools to help decision making, but at the, at the end of the day, we have, human, we have human beings making decisions, engaging with patients, as the examples of Dan and the video clearly show. Thank you. And with that very powerful remark, I'd like to round up our panel discussion 
I have personally learned very important lessons and takeaway messages uh, in this discussion. First, I believe there, is, there are very, very powerful opportunities in our health systems to improve population health management. At the foundation, we need to be better at using health information and data, which needs to be not disease specific, but more integrated, more holistic, combining health and social determinants of health. And we need to have this, not, at na ju not just at national level, where we are usually quite good at. We need to have this information at practice level and at community level. However, it's not only about data. And we, if we handle this exercise as an IT exercise, digital health exercise, or health information exercise, isolated from the model of care and the way we deliver services, then we will ultimately fail at the main objective, which is to deliver better, more holistic, more people-centered services to those in need. And finally, I like very much some of the points that focus us not just on the hardware, not just on the software, but also on the culture. The culture of how we design policies in health systems, how we design services, and how we deliver them. We need to move all our thinking to a much more holistic and team-based approach. And this culture change is what really takes a long time. With that, I would like to thank our panel. Thank you very much for your insights. I really enjoyed your experiences. I am sure our audience has also learned a lot from you. And now I invite you to join our two breakout sessions. Uh, we have one breakout session in English, moderated by Dr. Tony Dedeo, and the other breakout session in Russian language, moderated by Dr. Arnoldas Yurgutis. My colleagues are now pasting in the chat the links through which you can enter the breakout sessions. Some of our panelists will join the English language session, and I will be seeing you in the Russian language session as well. We really can't wait to hear your experiences. Did this talk show resonate with you? Did your country experience similar challenges, or do you have different solutions? Let's learn from each other. We're going to keep this main window open so that if you have trouble entering the breakout sessions, my colleagues will be here to try to guide you and give you some advice. When you close the main window, you will receive a survey, both in English and in Russian languages, asking your feedback on our talk show. This is very important to us because we seek to improve our talk shows every time. We would like to hear from you what kind of topics you would like us to focus on, and your opinion really matters. Please take the one minute to do so. And with that, I say goodbye to you and see you in the breakout sessions. See you next time.